Um, thank you all so much for joining us um, for the subject is murder crimes from the gaslight era. Um, we have a special guest tonight, crime historian, author EJ Wagner. Um, my name is Akoma Gaither and I'm a public program associate here at the Minnesota Historical Society. I'm very excited to have EJ here. Um, and this is one of many programs that we're doing in conjunction with the Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, the exhibition. Um, and we are going to dive into the history of forensic science tonight. E.J. Wagner is a storyteller and crime historian and author of the book of scientific entertainment titled The Science of Sherlock Holmes, which won the 2007 Edgar Award. Um, she is also a part of the Northeast Association of Forensic Science. Um, and EJ's audiences will recognize her scientific and sardonic approach to the history of forensic science among its descriptions of true cases and famous figures. She's presented on programs on folklore and the history of crime and um, to adult audiences for more than year, for more years than she cares to admit. Um, she researches her materials in such places as the Armed Forces Museum of Pathology in Maryland, the Suffolk, Suffolk County Office of the Medical Examiner, the Crime Laboratory of London's Metropolitan Police or the Scotland Yard, um, and the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. And she delves into ancient trial transcripts and medical texts, and um, she loves eavesdropping in public places as well. But <laughs> um, we're gonna get started here. First question, let's just dive into um, the history of uh, forensic science and um, how, how did the field evolve and how did it develop? Well, actually, there really is no such thing as forensic science. What we have is a group of disciplines and some of them are very, very exacting like toxicology. You know, you get a test for arsenic, you find arsenic, it's exciting, you know, that's what it is. But then there are things like blood spatter analysis, which are much more interpretive and a lot more depending on the skill and uh, the objectivity of the examiner. Forensic science as it is now, as is known now, didn't exist very long. Um, around 1900, it was referred to as medical jurisprudence. And um, it was really a footnote in a book on midwifery, otherwise known as obstetrics. Because the first great question that people who were interested in this posed was, was the stillborn child alive at birth or was it dead at birth? And if it was alive at birth and now it's dead, who was responsible? Most likely the mother. So this was very much of concern in physicians and midwives who were delivering babies. And then somebody had a wonderful idea. The first really objective test to tell. What they did was they took the lungs of the deceased baby and put it in a basin of water. And if it floated, they said, then it meant that it had breathed. And this was proof positive that the child had been born alive. And if it is now deceased, we have the culprit right there. And this went on for decades until someone noticed something that a decaying set of lungs will also float. Mm -hmm. So that if the fetus had died in utero or in the vaginal canal, you still might have, it had started to decay, we still might have floating lungs. And then they looked back and thought about all the women that had been incarcerated because they were found guilty of having killed an already dead child. And this is typical of a lot of forensic science. One, two steps forward, oh, and one step back. So that is where it began as part of obstetrical care. I see. And from there, they became more and more interested in examining the effect of trauma on the body. What happens after you die? And as they began to study it, they discovered that they had problems. 
people didn't like dead bodies being examined because it was considered part of witchcraft. It was considered threatening. People were afraid. People thought that dead bodies had all kinds of magical connections. And so laws were formed against it. So the growth of medical jurisprudence, as it was known, or forensic science, as it is known now, was very slow, very halting, but helped a lot by a man named Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Can you uh, touch upon a little bit, you know, how does Sherlock and... Well, and what, what uh, Conan Doyle did in constructing Sherlock Holmes was he was really, I don't know if this was his intention, but because Sherlock Holmes was such a fascinating figure and because he applied a scientific view of crime so intensely, he said, you know, we must not only see, we must observe. We have to be careful about what every single bit of a crime scene. His whole approach was very modern and it made it understandable to the reading public. And so when it was a matter of money, funding forensic labs, people who were reading Sherlock Holmes suddenly saw the point. Mm -hmm. Because for years before that, there was not even a police force in England. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had um, the, what they used to call thief takers. Mm -hmm. And these were people who were paid privately to investigate if somebody's house had been burglarized. And they, yeah, and they got part of the proceeds. Mm -hmm. So there were people who were thief takers who took a lot mm -hmm. and found that they could instigate crimes as well as solving them. One of the most famous was a guy named Jonathan Wilde. Is that a perfect name for someone who was, uh, yeah. But um, it really didn't work. And it wasn't until Sir Robert Peel, Bobby Peel, formed the first police force in London many years later that we, that's why we call them Bobbies, you know, British mm -hmm. cops, Bobbies. Yep. yep. Um, mm -hmm. Because they named in favor of Robert Peel. This is, um, one of the great steps forward, actually having a police force and actually after that, developing the idea that when you come to a crime scene, you must not only see, you must observe. You must preserve every little bit of evidence to put together um, what actually happened, keep notes. And um, at the same time, Sherlock Holmes stories were becoming so popular. I see. A man named Hans Gross in Germany, mm -hmm. which, um, he was an attorney actually, but a very fine eye for detail. And he wrote this huge, massive tome with an unpronounceable name in German, at least I can't do it, but it, it was all about how to examine a crime scene and how to preserve evidence. Mm -hmm. And he was really the German equivalent of Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. He was so clever. And one of the things I loved that he wrote if you wanted to see if the suspect was deaf, he claimed to be deaf, and you want to test him. Mm -hmm. The thing to do is come up behind him and drop something very heavy on the floor. And this is his observation. If he does not react, he's lying, he's not deaf. Because a deaf person will feel the vibration and react. It was this kind of subtlety that Gross was promoting over in Germany and Austria. Mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes was the promoter in England. He was not really alive, so he could never die. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to this idea of medical jurisprudence. And, um, you, you know, can you compare medical jurisprudence to forensic science? What's the difference? The words. <laughs> medical jurisprudence was well it was longer you know forensic means uh, forens means of the courts mm, i see and we didn't use that term until about 1910 okay before that it was medical jurisprudence but it is sort of a light in your mouth at once and forensic science and then of course when it was medical jurisprudence it was pretty much doctors looking at legal issues Mm -hmm. But as it grew, the, the, now the age of the generalist is completely over. Sherlock Holmes dabbled in a whole bunch of things. You know, he looked at dust, 
and he looked at fingerprints and he went mm -hmm. on and on and on. But today they're all separate. A document mm -hmm. examiner looks at documents and handwriting. Right. Um, the toxicologist looks at poisons mm -hmm. and so on. And the medical examiner, the forensic pathologist is going to look at the body uh, and they really don't mix. So you've mm -hmm. got to be careful when you read an article which informs you that a forensic expert said such and such, you want to know what does he an expert at? Mm -hmm. What is her speciality? Because sometimes I read something and I know that quoting a document examiner on a bullet wound, and you know, that really doesn't wash. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit about the history of uh, forensic pathology or, or um, the creation of a medical examiner, a body examiner, a coroner? Well, the coroner, the word coroner comes from crowner. It was someone representing the crown of England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his, in those days, it was always a he. His job was to get the body together with a bunch of citizens that all sit around and look at the body and they will decide whether they had a murder or not. In early England, sometimes you had to prove Englishry. In other words, France, France had, the Normans had conquered England. And when they were in control, they didn't care so much if you killed an Englishman, an Anglo-Saxon. It was if you killed a Norman that you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't want to have to pay too much of a fine for having killed somebody, you had to prove that he was English. And this was really the purpose of a lot of the early inquests. And a lot of it was completely based on superstition and witchcraft. They believed that if the murderer was in the presence of the corpse that he'd killed, the wounds would bleed afresh. Not true. Um, that sometimes, yeah, sometimes the corpse would weep at the sight of his murderer. It's all very poetic, you know, but it, it, there was nothing to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Out of this, out of the idea of citizens sitting in judgment on this issue, we got the jury. Mm -hmm. We got um, a grand jury, which we still have today. Yes. Yeah. And it sort of evolved very gradually. Now, the medical examiner was completely different. This was someone who had to have medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, today, a medical examiner, this is one of the longest um, residencies in medicine. After you get through going to medical school, there are years and years afterwards. Now, pathologists fall into three general categories. There's clinical pathology, which is they're looking largely through microscopes at cancerous cells and so on. There's anatomical pathology where they're doing um, autopsies and dissections in a hospital setting. But a forensic pathologist is combining his medical knowledge with legal knowledge. He's going to make he or she, there are a lot of women in the field now, Mm -hmm. are making the decision as to manner of death and cause of death. Mm -hmm. And then what the decision is then influences what the prosecution will or will not do, what the police will or will not do. The medical examiner is not supposed to represent the prosecution. He or she is standing for the people. The people will examine this dead person and decide, was this an accident? Mm -hmm. Was it a suicide? Was it a homicide or is it undetermined? Because sometimes you just can't tell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can you touch upon, um, you know, we were talking about police. I'm very interested in what early police training was for investigating crimes. Um, yeah, and, and how, uh, how well, did Conan Doyle? Very early training, they didn't train them. That's right. Um, I mean, the reason there weren't more disasters in England is they weren't armed. Uh, they were just people willing to do the job. Bobby Peel tried to institute a certain amount of training. That was a big step forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, in this country, of course, each state has its own method of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the police are very much fragmented among different states and different counties. So there's not, I'm very interested to know that in Scandinavia, for instance, it's years of training. 
Mm-hmm. It's as hard to become a policeman as it is to become an attorney or a physician, mm-hmm. which is, I think, something we ought to consider mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Um, I In your book, I was reading about um, uh, Jack the Ripper and how they... <laughs> We're basically contaminating the um, crime scenes. And that was pretty much the big case that like turned, um, you know, l- looking for evidence around the scenes. Is that is that true? How did they- well, No, what happened with Jack the Ripper is that it was a perfect example of how not to conduct um, a crime scene. Right. Everybody and their brother-in-law strolled through the dissecting room. We have absolutely no idea. And the uh, notes that were taken were incomplete. They were very often misspelled. You can't, re- there were letters that Jack the Ripper was supposed to have written, but we don't know if he really wrote them. We can't even be certain there was one killer. Right, yeah, mm-hmm. There could have been copycats, yeah. But on the other hand, it's it's really proved um, very useful for a lot of writers. Mm-hmm who speculate as to whom he might have been. And, and they, you know, right. I don't think it goes too far, but a lot of the fear of handling a body comes way back in the days when it was considered a part of witchcraft. Mm. Dissecting a body, you can't, you can't be a forensic pathologist if you can't dissect a body at the beginning to learn what it's supposed to look like when it's intact, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. before the disaster has occurred. You can't become a physician unless you know this. But for many, many years, it was against the law. And there were all kinds of ways of getting around it. For instance, uh, way back, way back now, 16th century, and uh, Vesalius, famous artist doing woodcutting, was fascinated by anatomy. Mm -hmm. But the only way he could get a subject was to steal it. He would go late at night. They would, you know, very often in those days, hang people and leave the body hanging or decapitate them. They were very creative in methods of execution. So he would steal the body and bring it back to his workshop. He did a lot of wood cutting. But here was the thing. The law said, you can't draw that. You cannot draw that dead body unless it is simply an art project. If it's an art project, it's okay. Oh, wow. So what he did, I'm gonna show you this. Yeah. He decorated everything. Can you see that? Can you hold it up just a little bit more? Oh wow. Wow. You see oh all, the, all the um greenery. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the flowers. And that was how he did everything. And we have his books now, the anatomical drawings. Mm, and all of them yeah people flayed alive but with all these lovely decorations of flowers and fruit sometime and Mm -hmm. um it was considered a work of art and that was acceptable to the church i see i see wow In, in those days i mean after that when they did allow a very limited amount of dissection it would usually be a matter of a whole group of um people standing on one side who chanted while Mm -hmm. another group of people on the other side of the room opened the body and pointed with a long point poker at various colorful organs. And this was considered, yeah, it was considered an examination. Physicians in those days who wrote, uh, invented complicated drugs for people to use were very much respected. Mm-hmm. Surgeons, on the other hand, who cut were not. And to this day in England, surgeons are called Mr. Doctors, who every ones who make house calls and actually treat you when you're sick, they're known as doctor. But the surgeon, the ancient memory of them being like barbers and oh, barbarous, I see. Mr. Wow. <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I want to go back to um, uh, talking about poisons. Poisons. 
One of my favorite subjects. Yes. <laughs> well, in the early, way early about the period of Vesalius, yes. poisons um, were usually animal oriented. They were to poisonous toads, snakes were used because there were very few poisons that wouldn't give themselves away in enormous immediately. They didn't know how to extract them. And then there was an Arab physician who was brilliant, who managed to perfect a form of arsenic, which was tasteless and mm -hmm. could be dissolved. And so arsenic became known in the Victorian era as inheritance powder. Mm -hmm. Because what on earth did you do with a difficult husband if there was no divorce? Guess you do the job yourself. I guess. Well, you did the best you could with what you had at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and also, there were no limits on what you could buy and, and use. They used to have something called Godfrey's Cordial, which was given to children who were particularly obstreperous and the mother needed to quiet them. It included opium. Oh, oh my goodness. And uh, you had to be careful with the dosage, but it worked very well. Right. Oh my gosh. Well, some, I know you have some um, poisons with yeah, you. Yeah, I have. I'll show you this was later on. People <laughs> realized that things growing in the garden weren't always just flowers. Mm -hmm. And I have here one of the earliest heavy metal. This is one of the earliest ones we could find in a laboratory. It's aconite. Can you put it up to the camera a little bit more? Aconite. Okay. Can you spell that? A-C-O-N-I-T-E. Aconite. Okay. And it was one of the earliest ones that we could find. Um, this is hemlock, which Socrates was forced to drink tea made of, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. They all look kind of unpleasant and dry, but you could make quite a nice tea out of it. And this is one of my fascinating ones. This is ricin. It comes from the castor oil plant. Oh, wow. And the castor oil plant is quite pretty. And it, um, if you swallow this complete, nothing will happen to you. If you chew it, you're going to die. Oh my goodness. It is extremely potent poison. And in 1978, as a matter of fact, a man named Georgi Markov, who was a Bulgarian dissident, then living in London, decided to cross the bridge in London to, and get a bus when someone bumped into him and evidently hit him with an umbrella and immediately apologized in a heavy foreign accent and disappeared into a taxi. Markov went to his job, which was as a broadcaster, and complained that he had a pain in his leg. He was dead a few days later. It was determined that he had been poisoned with ricin. Someone had injected it, probably the Bulgarian government. Wow. And the way they found it was they, there is no specific test for ricin. That is how painful and difficult the situation is. They had to remove a little bit of flesh from his buttock and they found a tiny little bead-like thing with two tiny holes in it. Obviously it had once contained something. The symptoms were typical of ricin, but there is no specific test for it. So what they did was they got some ricin and they injected it into an unfortunate pig and timed the reaction of the pig who succumbed within 24 hours with exactly the same physical changes that Markov had displayed. Mm. This sort of thing is still being trafficked throughout Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There were a number of cases that fit that pattern. What are some other ways in which they tested these uh, poisons uh, during the Victorian era? Do you have any? Well, other they were just beginning to learn the Reinsch test. You know, it was a matter of heating it and adding chloroform. And but um, the big biggest problem that they had during the Victorian era 
was that most people didn't know what happened to the body after they'd been poisoned. They really didn't, were not good at grasping the changes. Um, and I would like to point out that this was the period where in order to learn more about medical science, they required resurrection of the corpse. Right. Yes, let's get into so that. So I want to talk about that because I feel everyone should know how to resurrect a dead body if needed. You never know. It was a very complicated skill, actually. You needed um, three men and a conveyance. And I say men because women really did not get involved in this for good reason. They weren't in love in medical school. Um, it is not true that medical students did this. It was much too skillful to allow medical students to do it. And the way it usually worked was, first you had to know that somebody had just been buried. So this is a matter of gathering intelligence. You listened at taverns, you listened to pubs, who was talking about it, you knew where the grave was. One person would attend the funeral and observe how the stone was laid, how the flowers were spread. Very rich people, knowing that the medical uh, schools wanted these corpses, would go to great lengths to protect themselves. There was something known as a mort safe, which was a big iron slab, which was put on top of the grave and left there for about 10 days until they felt the body had decayed to a point where it was no longer of use. But poor people or middle-class people couldn't afford this. So they would sometimes hire someone to sit by the grave with a gun. What did you do if you wanted the body and the man with the gun was there? Well, you took him to a pub. You brought him a drink. This was being clever, but not far, 10, 15 minutes away, there'd be one man with a conveyance, a horse-drawn uh, cart of some kind. The horse's feet were covered with cloth to make no noise. Two men would go to the graveside carrying two tarpaulins, one on either side of the grave. Using an awl they would, and a, a small shovel, they would dig at the head of the grave, only the head. They wouldn't remove the entire coffin. Now, when you think about it, the coffin takes up about two feet. So even if you've buried it six feet deep, you've only got four feet to go. Four feet down in a grave that is just dug the day before isn't that difficult. But you must remove every single bit of earth and put it on one of the tarpaulins. It must be very neat. Once they got down to the coffin, they would crack the head of the coffin open with an awl. And then there were two, one of two things they did. They either had something called a hook, which went into the back of the corpse's neck and the corpse was dragged up through the small hole and put on the second tarpaulin. Now, the problem with this is it sometimes damaged the goods. And as a result, they used a harness. Uh, this was, you know, a more modern way of doing it. We strapped the harness around the upper part of the body under the arms and pulled it up that way. Once the body was on the second tarp, we stripped it. You put every bit of clothing back into the grave. The reason being that taking the body was a misdemeanor, but taking the clothes was a felony. The I law don't spoke. understand the logic of that, but okay. <laughs> every single bit of material they used, every instrument they used was put on one of the other tarpaulins. So when they got through, they had two big bundles. They were very careful to take everything back with them. They put the dirt back in the grave and they try to reconstruct it to look as normal as possible. Mm -hmm. And then they would drive it off to the medical school. Now the medical schools would pay very well for this, which brings me to a tale. Mm -hmm. right. Can you go into uh, our famous- I will. <laughs> I will tell you. Burke and hair. A yeah. Burke and hair. <laughs> well, there is a song, a little sing-song thing that children sometimes sing in the British Isles. Up the close and down the stair, butt and bend with burke and hair. A close is sort of an alley in Old Scots, and butt and bend means in and out. 
So it's up the close and down the stair, but in bend with Burke and Hare. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, but Knox, he's the boy that bought the beat. Now the kids sing this, they don't know what it means, but I'm here to tell you. It was 1828 and Burke and Hare ran a boarding house along with the two ladies who shared their lives. I use the term loosely. In the back of the house, there was a small room which had only one window, which looked over a wall, a blind wall made of brick. There was no light. And in this room lived an old man whose name was Donald. Donald was a retired construction worker. He had very little money. And this was the best that he could do to live out his elderly years, He's living with Burke and Hare. And he paid four pounds a month this privilege. And he was very responsible about paying his bills, except one month he didn't. He had a very good reason. He died. Burke and Hare went into his room to collect their money and found the corpse lying on the bed. They were furious. They were counting on that money. How were they supposed to go to the pub and have a drink if there was no money? What are they going to do? And now they had to bury him. They had to find a grave for him. And then they thought the medical school wasn't far away. And there were two famous dissectors, professors who were uh, very skilled in anatomical dissection, a Dr. Monroe and a Dr. Knox. And they had heard that these two gentlemen would buy bodies for dissection for their students. In those days, the students paid the professors directly. You had your choice. You wanted to take a class with Dr. Monroe, you did that. If you wanted a, a class with Dr. Knox, you did that. But Dr. Knox was known to always have fresher corpses, probably because he paid more than Dr. Monroe. So Burke and Hare thought about it. And they put Donald's body into a cart, trundled it over the cobblestones, got to the door of Dr. Knox's dissecting room and knocked. And Dr. Knox inspected the goods, offered them seven pounds 10. Now they did the math. Donald alive was only good for four pounds in rent, but dead. Daddy's worth seven ten. The spirit of the entrepreneur grew apace. They thought immediately they could produce more goods. So they went to work. The next person on your list was a very beautiful young woman of the town known as Mary Patterson. And Mary Patterson um, was well known in many ways by a number of the medical students. Burke and Hare took her out for a few drinks at the pub. And when she became inebriated, took her home and invent, this is their new invention, leaned on her chest. So much pressure that she could not breathe. The lungs could not expand. Inventing an entirely new way of killing people known to this day as burking. Mary Patterson was sold to Dr. Monroe. Many of the students looking at her must have recognized her. As I said, they had known her. One of them drew her and then they dissected her body. She was followed by Jamie. Now, of course, Jamie, we would today call him um, special needs, but in old Scotland, they called him daft, daft Jamie. He was about 17 years old. He was a bit slow and his feet were very badly deformed so that he could never wear shoes. He no longer lived with his mother, but had come back for meals. And one night he didn't come back and his mom went out looking for him. It was a cold night. She walked up and down the cobblestones calling Jamie. Jamie, come home, son. It's raining out. But Jamie never came home again because he was prone on Dr. Knox's dissecting table. 
his distinguishable feet no longer there because Dr. Knox had had them removed and incinerated. He was never seen again. 16 times that cart made that dreadful trip across the cobblestones to Dr. Knox's dissecting room. 16 times until at last on one day, two people named Gray were renting that same room with a blind wall from Dr. from Burkett Hare. When they noticed that there was a very odd mattress made of straw in one corner of the common room. And every time they went near it, Burkett Hare would become agitated. So when the landlords were out for a moment, Mrs. Gray went up and pulled back the straw to find the dead body of one of the townspeople. She turned, and just as she turned, Burke and Hare were back. One of them, realizing that there were two people now who were witnesses, they couldn't kill them both. Then neither one was drinking, neither one was inebriated. Both of them were very upset. And so they offered them money, 10 pounds, 10 pounds for these very poor people who did not know where they would sleep from one night to the next, didn't know where their next meal came from, 10 pounds. And Mrs. Gray thought about it, thought about never being cold again. And then she turned, ran down the street, banged her fists on the constable's door and screamed, murder. <gasps> Burke and Hare were arrested and they went to trial. Hare turned Crown's evidence, testified against Burke. Burke was found guilty. Hare was allowed to escape into the crowd and no one is quite certain of what happened to him. But Burke. Burke was hanged. And after he was hanged, his body was given to Dr. Monroe for dissection. And his body was skinned and his hide was turned into a cover for books, one of which was a copy of the trial transcript. Oh my goodness. And so now Dr. Knox, who must have noticed something odd about all the very fresh corpses arriving on a bi-weekly basis, claimed complete ignorance of the matter. I saw a fresh corpse. I needed it for my studies. I paid for it. I shall continue to do just as I have done. There was an inquiry made, but he was not found guilty. It was simply suggested that he might be a bit more meticulous about running his laboratory. However, the students, for some reason, stopped going so often to Dr. Knox. And after a while, he lost his position and wound up as sort of an itinerant lecturer someplace in London. Mm -hmm. Up the close and down the stair, but in bend with Burke and Hare. Burke's the killer, here's the thief. But Knox, he's the boy that bought the beef. Thank you for that story, EJ. <laughs> it gives me chills. Oh my goodness. Oh. Well, next <laughs> next uh, topic that I wanted to get into um, is what cases um, did Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Um, which ones were, was he involved in? Well, he was involved in a couple of them, and yeah. uh, one of them occurred not, it was sort of at the same time that his first wife was dying and he was deeply depressed and upset. And um, it was a young man who was an attorney who qualified as a lawyer. His father was the vicar and uh, his name was Edelgy. And Edelgy was of mixed race. He was part Indian and part of Indian descent and part British, his mother was British. So that he had always had a rather odd place in society there in the little town that he lived in. And um, there were people with 
never felt quite comfortable having an Indian vicar. Animals were found badly injured at night. A couple of cows and there was a pony and their stomachs were slit, their abdomens were slit, but not so deeply to kill them, just enough to have them bleed to death. And people began to accuse Edelgy of doing this. Mm. So the evidence was absolutely ridiculous. It, I mean, they said they found blood on his, uh, on his boots but the, and mud, the mud didn't come from the area where the horses, where the animals were. And the blood turned out to be rust. And, but in spite of the fact, they became enamored of the idea of having this man take the blame. Of course. And Conan Doyle was not only a physician, but he'd gone to Germany for specialized training in ophthalmology. And when he saw Edelgy, he was very much aware of the fact that his vision was very poor. And so Conan Doyle felt that he could not only um, not have committed this crime, he couldn't have even found a pony in that dark, in the dark with his vision as poor as it was, let alone perform this rather delicate surgery on. And so he was determined uh, to get Edelgy freed. He wrote a pamphlet about it in his own, in his, at his own expense, mm -hmm. in great detail. And eventually after years of ups and downs legally, they had it overturned and LG was now free. Um, God. There was another case <laughs> years later, Oscar Slater, who was um, accused of having killed a woman named Gilchrist. She was a very wealthy old lady who lived um, in an upstairs flat with her um, maidservant who took care of him. And she had a vast jewelry collection. And the maidservant went out one day and came back to find Ms. Gilchrist killed, bludgeoned on the head with no one knew exactly what. And um, somewhere along the line, they decided that Oscar Slater, someone identified him, in spite of the fact that he had a very good alibi, Someone had taken a diamond brooch from Miss Gilchrist and pawned it. But when they followed the brooch, they discovered that the brooch was not the same one, that Oscar Slater was supposed to have sold the brooch and it was not the same one that belonged to Miss Gilchrist. The entire case simply was full of holes. However, Oscar Slater had not the greatest reputation, A, and B, he was Jewish. So once again, we have someone who is the other, someone who doesn't fit, someone who is easy to wrong. Mm -hmm. And you have the police convinced that they have got the right guy. And even if they haven't, he should be the right guy. So let's just arrange things. And uh, Slater was found guilty, sentenced to hang. But the outcry, even among the general population, this was, just didn't make sense. So they um, changed it to life imprisonment. He served 18 years at hard labor. Mm -hmm. And um, two men, William Ruffid and Conan Doyle, both attorneys, um, both writers, and Ruffid was an attorney, mm -hmm. gathered enough information, wrote enough pamphlets, got the emotional impact across to the general population to an extent where they finally released Slater after 18 years in prison. So these two cases um, indicate a great deal to us about Conan Doyle, what sort of man he was, right. mm -hmm. which was someone of enormous courage and perspicacity who would go out of his way at great lengths for what he felt was right. Right. He fought for justice. I like never knew that. So, wow. Um. I'm curious, how how did superstitions play into people's perspectives during this era, the Victorian era, in terms of, of um, I guess, cases? I, I find uh, Conan Doyle, how he, you know, touched upon superstition and, and was also 
quite fascinated with that in his in his real life, you know. So, yeah. Well, Conan Doyle became um, obsessed with spiritualism. Spiritualism, yes. And uh, one of his friends was Houdini, the magician, oh, yeah. who was completely scientifically oriented. Mm -hmm. a lot of magic is very much like writing crime stories. You know, they make you look at the right hand and the real stuff's gone on with the left hand. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he had no patience with this at all. So that really strained that friendship a great deal. Oh. Mm -hmm. But um, you, see sh you see shades of Conan Doyle of his beginnings in old cases. And he used to read old cases. And Sherlock Holmes has, he says to, at one point to Watson, um, make a long arm, Watson, get down the M's. And there, it's an old case, which is important to him. And I've often felt that one of the cases which had to be really important, that old case that Sherlock Holmes must have looked at, mm -hmm. is that of Parkman and Webster. Oh, mm -hmm. And Boston, 1839. Yeah. Um, a gentleman who was a physician named Parkman, now a businessman, very wealthy, but parsimonious. So he did not own a horse. So he'd do all his own walking, strode down the street, and stopped at a shop ordered lettuce to be taken to his home, made a few more stops. He had lent a lot of money and he collected some of the money that was owed to him and strode off towards the medical school. Now the medical school in those days, Harvard Medical School, sort of was in a two-story building which sort of was crouched at the edge of the Charles River. And the two bottom stories of it, where the dissecting vaults were, were right over the water and wooden stilts went into the murk of the Charles River. And that is where they would dispose of the bits and pieces of the corpses they dissected in teaching students. And then the river would rise, the little bits of flesh would rise and gently go with the tide. Mm. So Dr. Parkman walked into the medical school that day, people saw him climb the steps. No one ever saw him alive again. The great mystery in Boston was what happened to Dr. Parkman? Now, at Harvard Medical School in those days, there was a gentleman named Dr. Webster and Dr. Webster was the head of chemistry department. It was a very important school. Oliver Wendell Holmes was the head of it. Um, and the uh, bodies that they used were usually procured for them by the porter, whose name was Ephraim Littlefield, who was very skilled at opening graves and removing what he needed. Dr. Webster's uh, laboratory was not far from where Littlefield lived with his wife and children. They had a little apartment nearby. It must have been pretty odiferous, but the, Littlefield didn't mind, evidently. Dr. Watson, um, Dr. Webster, in a fit of generosity, gave Littlefield uh, a Thanksgiving turkey. This was just before Thanksgiving in 1849. And Littlefield had a very odd reaction to it. He'd never gotten anything from Dr. Webster before. And he was a little suspicious. And Dr. Parkman was missing. And he seemed to have remembered hearing a fire burning in Dr. Webster's laboratory. And so late one night, when everybody was gone from the medical school, Littlefield got a chisel and began to chink his way through five layers of brick into the privy underneath Dr. Webster's laboratory. And he made a hole big enough for his head to fit through and a lantern which blew out because there was a breeze coming in from the water. He looked down and he saw a human pelvis 
with male genitalia attached and a small bit of intestine. And he said it once, I knew this was no place for such things. He immediately reported it to the police and the police began to investigate and discovered that Dr. Webster had owed Dr. Parkman $400, which was a huge sum in those days. The salary for a college professor at that period was $1,200 annually. Mm. You can imagine what a huge sum 400 was and that he had not paid him back and that Dr. Parkman had gone to the medical school in order to meet him to discuss this problem. So they immediately sweat began to search Dr. Webster's laboratory. And when they went into the laboratory itself, they found a tea chest that was about three feet square. And in it, they found a human thorax into which a thigh had been thrust and a set of mineral teeth. Wow. Dr. Parkman had had false teeth and he just had them made recently because he was about to give a big speech and he wanted to look his very best. Mm -hmm. Dr. Webster, was immediately arrested. Mm -hmm. Daniel Webster was asked to defend him, but declined. A number of well-known criminal attorneys were asked and declined. Mm -hmm. So he wound up using a civilian attorney, someone who had dealt with his financial issues, named Sawyer, who was not really adept at criminal law. The judges at the time, they had three judges sitting rather than just one. The most important one, the head of the department was Lemuel Shaw, mm. who took um, a very stringent look at this and was very clearly prejudiced against Webster from the very beginning. The defense was pretty much that the body was not that of Parkman. The body was that of um, someone who had been resurrected from a grave and brought to the medical school for dissection and why it was in the wrong place and why it was put down in, in the privy, they had no idea. Maybe somebody recognized it or they were afraid somebody would recognize it. This was the defense essentially, it's not Parkland. Mm -hmm. um, a handwriting expert was brought in. Now this is one of the first cases in American jurisprudence where somebody who was skilled at handwriting recognition was allowed to testify. And he said that some of the notes that had come to the court claiming that Dr. Parkman had been seen alive somewhere else mm -hmm. were written by Dr. Webster. He recognized the handwriting. This was heavy evidence. The defense being, this is a very erratic field. Uh, there are a lot of false assumptions. You cannot prove it, it's just your opinion. Mm -hmm. So it hinged on this. A, is Dr. Parkman dead? B, is this Dr. Parkman? C, did Dr. Webster kill him? Did finding the corpse in his rooms mean that he killed him or did someone plant it there? Mm -hmm. This was a circumstantial case. There was no direct evidence that they could recognize. Mm -hmm. And so Lenuel Shaw, who was the chief judge, made law. This is a case where we have the first definition of when you apply circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. And he is the example, you know, if you walk, if you see someone walk into a room and walk out again, and there is a corpse left behind, the person who left is the killer. Maybe not the best, maybe not the most accurate, but that was how he phrased it. And that is what we still have today when we look at the circumstantial case. You eliminate what couldn't have happened, back to Sherlock Holmes again, you eliminate what couldn't have happened and what is left, no matter how extreme, no matter how fantastic, must be the truth. So the jury found Dr. Webster guilty, mm. sentenced to hang. And there was a tremendous outcry. Many people had enormous sympathy for him and yeah. found it impossible to leave that this very well-bred, highly intelligent chemistry professor had brutally killed this man and taken this body apart. And while they were waiting 
and he was imprisoned and they were arguing about whether or not they could overturn the verdict. Mm -hmm. A confession appeared. And in this confession, he said that Dr. Parkman had come to him in his laboratory that day and spewed invective at him, demanding his money, threatening that if he didn't pay him back at once, terrible things were going to happen to him and his family and everyone else. And he would bring down the wrath of society upon him and insulted him to such an extent, Webster said, that he became so upset that he grabbed the first thing he could, a heavy wooden uh, rod that happened to be lying near the laboratory desk and he flung it at his head, hit him so hard that he collapsed, bled a little and was still. Wow. He admitted he had done it, but what he was arguing was manslaughter. This was not a premeditated murder. He hadn't planned to kill him. He hadn't stabbed him. Mm -hmm. It was a sudden loss of, of decorum, a loss of passion had come yeah. over him. Manslaughter. But there was one problem. He destroyed the body. Mm. So they could not possibly isolate the head was missing. They couldn't prove that he'd been struck in the head just once. And so he was denied clemency. Yeah. And that summer, Dr. Webster, the most respected Dr. Webster, the one who wrote the chemistry book that was required reading at all the medical schools, was taken from the prison to a place of execution and a rope was placed around his neck and the trap door was sprung and the body went down six feet and stopped. And his friends collected the body and they buried it secretly because they were afraid of resurrectionists. Well, thank you for that, EJ. Um, we only have one minute left, so I'm just going to ask you our last question, and that is, what did we learn today? What has Conan Doyle taught us? Well, what he has taught us is that it is important to observe the crime scene, not just to see, but to observe. Well, thank you so much. I am so sorry we did not get to anyone's questions today, um, but you can find um, EJ's contact information in the slides um, that was sent and she loves questions. So um, if you have any, please send them her way. And thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a good evening. <laughs>